God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Did you know something strange about that phrase so far? The plural, huh? Let us make man in our image. After our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him. Male and female created them. The word image there occurs three times, by the way. I think it's kind of interesting. We have, echoing here, a concept of the Trinity. Now, obviously, you notice the plurals, the us and our. You find that not only in verse 26 here. You'll find it in chapter 3, verse 22, chapter 11, 7. You'll find it in Isaiah. In fact, you'll find it all through the Old Testament, not just the New. And the word Elohim itself that we encountered in, remind you in chapter, chapter 1, verse 1, is a plural noun. The I am ending, certain Hebrew nouns have, a, 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 the plural is indicated by an I am ending, cherubim and so forth. So it's a plural noun, always treated as a singular verb. And that appears 680 times in the, in the Old Testament. And yet, on the other hand, we have a problem, because many people are, of course, very sensitive to the fact that the Shema, that, 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 that uh, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, emphasize that we have one God. Right? Here, Israel, the Lord our God is one. Echad. He's unified. What the word really means, unity, but okay. And Exodus 20, verse 3, in the Ten Commandments, same assertion is made. Now, that's, and many people see that as in contrast to the New Testament, which continually speaks of the plurality, the Trinity. And there's lots of verses on that. We don't have to beat that one to death. What may surprise you to discover, in fact, you need to discover it for yourself, is that, see, you and I have trouble with that if we don't recognize the possibility of having plurality and unity at the same time. You, we and I tend to think those are opposites, not necessarily. There are lots of examples where you can have unity, and yet there's a plurality of people involved. A corporation is a typical example, uh, where you have a corporation that's one before the law and yet can cons consist of three principles and so forth. Those are all clumsy examples for a lot of reasons, but the, the, the reason we can't visualize that because we can't imagine perfect unity. So you and I can't imagine a partnership of three people that get along perfectly. <laughs> so. So I'll leave that alone. There, it's interesting that there are in the scripture exchanges among the Godhead. And uh, uh, several of them we'll encounter as we go through Genesis. We find it several times in Isaiah. Perhaps the great example is Psalm 2. And I don't want to take the time tonight, but I encourage you in your notes to write down Psalm 2 as an assignment. And I want you to study it and make a diagram of that psalm in terms of who's speaking. Psalm 2 is a I start to say a dialogue, that's two people, it's a trilogue, it's a discussion among three people. And you take Psalm 2 and outline it and decide who are the three people speaking. And obviously you're going to discover it, one's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, check it out for yourself, discover it for yourself, and your, these verses will be in your notes so you can follow through a number of places where there is a discussion among the persons of the Godhead. Now, another way to look at this Trinity thing, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I want to... The creation of the universe is ascribed to the Father in Psalm 102. It's ascribed to the Son in Colossians 1.16 in the first opening verses of the Gospel of John. It's ascribed to the Holy Spirit in Genesis, second verse, and also in Job 26. And, of course, all three of these are gathered in the concept of Elohim in the first verse. The creation of man is ascribed to the Father in Genesis 2.7. We'll see that next session. The uh, Son in Colossians 1.16, we looked at that before, and uh, Job 33. And also in, the creation is ascribed in plural terms to in Ecclesiastes 12 and Isaiah 54. The incarnation itself ascribed to the Father in Hebrews 10.5, to the Son in Philippians 2.7, and uh, by, to the Spirit in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. The death of Christ is ascribed to the Father in Psalm 22, Romans 8. In John 3, John 3, 16, most famous verse of the Bible. The death of Christ is ascribed to the Son in John 10, 18, and Galatians 2, 20. And it's ascribed to the Holy Spirit in Hebrews 9, 14. So it's interesting that you'll find verses that ascribe each of these major milestones of God's program, ascribed specifically to each member of the, the Godhead. The atonement is ascribed to the Father in Isaiah 53, twice to the Son in Ephesians 5.2, to the Spirit in, in, in Hebrews 9.14. And uh, the resurrection of Christ is ascribed to the Father in Acts 2.24 and Romans 6.4, to the Son in John 10 and in John 2, and the Holy Spirit in 1 Peter 3.18 and Romans 8, verse 11. 
The resurrection of all mankind is described to the Father in John 5.21 and also to the Son in 5.21. Both are mentioned there. And Romans 8.11, the Son. The inspiration of the scriptures, by the way, there's 29 of these. I'm not giving you all of them. Just one. The point is, you, as you go through the Bible and you take the trouble to take each major event you'll be, and you look upon it, you'll discover it's ascribed in different contexts to each, each member of the, of the Trinity. The inspiration of the scripture by the, to the Father in 2 Timothy 3.16, 1 John, uh, excuse me, uh, 1 Peter uh, to the Son, 1 Peter 1, and to the Spirit in 2 Peter 1. Now, the other thing, we start talking about, you, you, we get in a lot of discussion, what does it mean? God made man in his own image. What does that mean? Boy, there's, we're going to talk a little bit more about the image of man in a minute, but recognize that any, any by the way, there's a basic principle I'm going to suggest to you, beyond just this issue. If you come across something that doesn't seem to make sense, praise God, because you're about to make a discovery, whatever that might be. And you do two things. First, you pray about it. It's not an intellectual exercise, it's a prayerful thing. The second thing you do is put Jesus Christ right in the middle of it and see what happens. Just see what happens. Now this whole issue of Jesus Christ, he was made, of course, in the likeness of men. No, no question about that. Philippians 2.7, Hebrews 10.5, Luke 1.35. At the same time, we also know from Hebrews 1.3 and Colossians 1.15 and 2 Corinthians 4.4 that he was made in the express image of God. That's exactly what the book of Hebrews opens up with. So if you want to try to rec you know, wrestle with this issue, what do we mean by man being the image of God or vice versa? Jesus Christ is your, your starting and ending point. And all of these things, by the way, are anticipated in God's plan of redemption, as you'll find in 1 Peter 1.20, Revelation 17, interestingly enough, and 2 Timothy 1.9. But let's, let's move on, because there's lots, lots more I want to cover here.